share a bit today, we um, to go back to um, something we've uh, been doing in previous weeks, which was looking at aspects of what we call the Lord's Prayer, but through the lens of um, the book of Psalms. Um, there are people who say that um, Jesus model prayer for us. We call it the Lord's Prayer. It's not the Lord's Prayer. Sorry, a little me to go against generations of people calling it the Lord's Prayer, but it's not. Jesus did not need to pray, forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our sins. But what he did do was lay out a model prayer for his followers, his disciples everywhere, for every generation, the kind of prayers that should be arising from our hearts daily. Give us this day our daily bread. So what he did was teach his disciples the form of prayer, the manner of praying that should be arising from the hearts of Jesus' followers in every generation. Now, I may be a bit of a, you know, Baptists are non-conformists, aren't we? That's what we are. We, we're one of a series of group of people who are prepared not to conform when the Lord leads us that way. So we're non-conformists. So one thing I don't particularly like to conform to is to frequently just recite the words of the Lord's Prayer. I don't mind personally doing it every now and again, but I don't like doing it all the time. And I'll show you exactly why. Can we look, and we'll do it today, can I um, read with you <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 to 13. And look what Jesus says at the beginning, at the very beginning of his model prayer. He must have known that this model prayer would be followed generation after generation amongst those who would come to know and love him. And he said this, when you pray, and say if you pray, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions, oh wow, as the heathen do, we'll carry on, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, after this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now that's definitely a prayer for those who know the Lord and love him, who have given their hearts to Jesus and found him to be their savior. This is amazing grace. I couldn't help thinking about amazing grapes this morning, but that's my rather odd way of thinking. <clears throat> Amen. So, so how does this prayer start? Our Father. This is not a prayer for unbelievers looking for Jesus. It's a prayer for those who know him. Our Father. <clears throat> and he doesn't start off... At, Really, the point I want to make today is that this prayer does include dealing with, um, with our sins, with our, in old language, and the old language is helpful, with our trespasses. But it does not start there. This is interesting to me. What is our priority as 
the Lord's followers as his disciples. Well, hallowed be thy name, honoring the name of Jesus, giving glory to him in every circumstance, in every situation, good, bad, difficult, pleasant, just giving glory to him and praying, Lord, may your kingdom come on the earth. And there's lots of songs that put that in nice ways that we should pray that we have a little bit of heaven down here. Amen. One day, we sung it in our first song. Every knee shall bow. One day, every tongue will confess. And we start now. Amen. And we pray in our own hearts, in our own circumstances, in our own situations, in our own neighborhood. Lord, your kingdom come on the earth. That's the role of people. It's not the role of angels. It's not the role of animals. It's the role of people. Human beings are unique in all of God's creation in that we have this ability, God-given ability, to call out to him and pray. Day and night, Jesus made a point of leading his disciples and saying to them, now, don't give up praying. Don't cease to pray. That's your privilege as a human being made by God in the earth for the time he has given you to pray. Lord, your kingdom come. Amen. In my family, in my friends, in where you lead me, Amen. Now, what I wanted to just emphasize today was that this model prayer, it does get to deal with the issue of sin, but it is not first priority for the believer. Why not? Because Jesus appeared and came to the earth to deal with sin. It was a problem. It was a problem for every human being because nobody can say, I have not sinned or I am without sin. But Jesus came to deal with it and he came to deal with it by one sacrifice offered once for all forever. And in God's sight, any human being anywhere who trusts in what Jesus has done, who he is, and what he can accomplish in the human heart, in his resurrection power, any follower of Jesus should be in a place where we stand and say, my sin, not in part, but the whole, has been dealt with by Jesus at the cross. Now, that's not denial of the fact that I have this issue in, while I'm in this life, but it is saying sin is not my priority, thinking about it, worrying about it. God is my priority. Glorifying his name is my priority. Praying your kingdom come. Amen. That's what he made human beings for. That's what he asks us to do. And that's what he empowers us to do. To glorify his name in the lives we live. Amen. Jesus appeared on the earth once who himself was faultless. 
What did Pilate say? I, I love that phrase. I find no fault in him. And Pilate was looking to find fault. And he couldn't find it. A perfect life. Pure. Human. Humble. Ordinary. Living among us. But without sin. And yet he became sin for us. How and why? So that we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. We really shouldn't, well, how can I say it? Un underestimate's not a strong enough word. We shouldn't undervalue what Jesus has done in making an end of sin at the cross. He did it. When he cried, it is finished. It is finished. There will come a day when every believer, all of us, we will gather. We will be part of a world yet to come, yet to be revealed. When, when every eye shall see him. And he will be manifestly throughout all of his creation, king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. Now, there isn't going to be more work that Jesus has to do before that new creation is ushered in. It's done. He's finished the work. Sin has been utterly dealt with. Now, the issue is, it's not been fully worked out yet, but the work has been done. Amen. He will come and he will wipe away every tear every stain every sadness every pain he will come all right you say well okay mr preacher if sin has been dealt with why does there come a point in the lord's prayer where jesus does say well you need to pray this way Forgive us our, I like the old-fashioned word, forgive us our trespasses. And pretty much pray it every day. If sin has been dealt with, if by his spirit he has worked um, to cleanse my heart, to change my habits, to change who I am by his grace, How come I need to pray daily, forgive me my trespasses? I'll tell you why I like that word trespass. It's not in the version we read this morning. It is in some of the older versions. Because we all know what tr trespasses are, don't we? Trespasses, trespassers will be prosecuted. We all know what a trespass is. It's Well, let's put it this way. Look, we've got a carpet here. I'll mess up the microphone. If I'm careful. And um, well, let's say, you know, when God made Adam and Eve and put them in the garden and he gave them everything they needed to live for his glory and he set boundaries, didn't he? He said, but you can do this, you can do that, you can eat this, you can name these animals, you can keep this garden, eat of the tree of life. That would have been good. That would have saved us an awful lot of problems. But there are boundaries. So I'm thinking of this carpet here, and there's a boundary to the carpet there, and there's a boundary to the carpet there. And it's still true in principle for you and me now. Live within the boundaries that God has set for us to live within. And those are broadly laid out in his commands to us, which we are, as Christians, who can live by the power of the Spirit, we can live in a way which fulfills his purpose for our lives. Inwardly and outwardly, we can do it by his grace. 
But um, God said to Adam and Eve, live within the boundaries I've set. And Adam and Eve said, um, no, I'm going outside the boundaries. And that was sin. Don't, one thing you mustn't do, just one thing, don't eat that. Well, we must remember, we'd all done it. It's no good blaming Adam. It really isn't. We'd have all, we, we're all, you know. So stay within the boundaries, and Adam didn't. Adam and Eve, they trespassed. And the trouble with trespassing is, let's say that um, God's goal for humanity always, for every human being, is that we should, in the way we live, inherit the glory of God. Ma mankind was made, we were made for his glory. We were made to glorify him and to know that glory in our own hearts. Amen. Now, let's say the purpose of my life is to reach, I'm going to say somewhere around uh, where Melanie is, okay? <laughs> that, that's my goal. That's my goal. That's my purpose, all right? But I don't stay within the boundaries God has set, and I, I trespass. Okay? In trespassing, something else happens. I fall short of the glory of God. I fall short of his purpose for me. I mean, if we were to read the book of Romans, it would say to us, everybody's sinned. Everybody's sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We, we make it of ourselves. We got shut out. Man's spiritual awareness, his, his knowledge of God got cut off. We became inside dead to his presence. Amen. And that's what Jesus came to earth and showed us a new humanity, a different kind of humanity, a humanity without fault, which lived and even died and lives forevermore for the glory of God. And Jesus died, shed his blood once to restore you and me into the place where we can fulfill God's purpose, you and I were born so that we might inherit his eternal life and glory. And the tragedy of the human heart that doesn't turn to Jesus is that it falls short <coughs> of God's glory. But we can. We can be who God intends us to be, we can, by his grace. Amen. So, so, um, so if we've all fallen short, we've all, we inherited, we wouldn't have done any better, we've inherited a place where Adam took humanity, where we're, we're dead. There's a ceiling above us. We don't know him. We're cut off. And Jesus took our place at the cross. Cut off in his early manhood as a 33 years or so, made a sacrifice that he might stand in the place of being um, shut out, cursed is the actual word, by God in our place that a way might be opened for us to come back from the dark paths of sin. 
how? How do I get to the place where God always intended me to be? Well, um, can we look at a couple of verses from um, Psalm 51? Is that all right? Psalm 51 is... uh, People know the circumstances in which this psalm was written. It was a it was a psalm of David. David had made a big mistake. Big, big mistake. You know what had happened? He saw a woman bathing. He did an awful lot wrong. He abused his power as a king. He called for her to come to his palace. In so doing, he would have corrupted some of his officials. One thing led to another. It wasn't just um, he betrayed one of his best military commanders. She was his wife. In the end, after what had happened, Bathsheba became pregnant. Then he got into intrigue and deception got the man killed to try to cover up all his problems. That's the trouble with sin. One one thing leads to another. And David was in a bad way. He'd been anointed king over God's people, and he'd made some pretty serious mistakes. There are those who think that in some ways, the kingdom never quite recovered from that. But anyway, let's read these few verses when David comes to the point where we all need to come to. I've got to get right with God about this. I, I can't carry on in denial. I can't carry on pretending things are okay. They're not. I need to get right with God. So what did David pray? We're just reading the heart of the psalm together. <clears throat> Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Amen. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. How are you going to get right, David? How are you going to, um, how are you going to find that presence, that joy, that peace that comes from walking with God? Lord, create a clean heart in me. How's that going to happen, David? Renew a right spirit. Come by your own Holy Spirit, your generous spirit, because God gives without measure. And come to my heart by your spirit. Make me spiritually alive again. That's why Jesus is praying always now, seated at the right hand of the Father and praying for you and me. What's he praying? Send the Spirit, Lord. Send the Spirit. Send the Spirit into their hearts. He wants to pour it out. Pour it out. And create a clean heart in you and me. Amen. I was reading an account of a revival in Korea a little while back. And what a revival is, is when lots of people get utterly turned around. This this generous spirit from God, which creates a new heart, is poured out on many people all at once. And it happens in different countries at different times. There are seasons when God visits peoples. Amen. And it's happened in the UK, not recently, but it's still happening in different places around the world, and it will do until he comes again. 
And I was reading about when revival hit Korea and the, a man in charge of a meeting. Um, and the Lord was really moving and he, he had no control over the meeting. God was just moving powerfully. And he said about halfway through the meeting, he looked around and he suddenly began to get a bit frightened. And he was looking around. He said, I hope there's no policeman here. Because the things that were being confessed as people had to get right with God. And they couldn't be silent about it. They just had to be like David was here. Look, this is me, Lord. This is who I am. This is what I've done. Come to my heart. Amen. And he said he was so glad there was nobody with a notebook. Anything you say might be taken down. The police would have been too busy. Amen. How, how, do we, how do we get this balance right between the fact that it is not my job as one of the Lord's people to be obsessed with sin? I don't need to start off saying, oh, I'm a, you know, there, there is a version of evangelical Christianity which is, oh, I'm so many, I've got so many sins, I must confess them all today, and I better confess them all again later on. That's not how Jesus taught us to pray and how to live. He taught us to glorify his name and not ignore the fact that we do need to pray, well, forgive me my trespasses. I heard it put this way. Um, apparently, there was an idea around, most of us have heard of... Um, People like John Wesley and um, <clears throat> George Whitfield, that was when there was revival in this land. And many, many came to God and it left a mark. And although that salt is being kind of lost, to this day, some of the effects are still with us. But there was an idea around at that time, and I need to be careful to get it right. And it was this, there, there, are, there are four states of human beings, four, four, the four states for humanity. The first state was God created Adam and Eve. They were, they were in a state of innocence. They were able to sin. That's right, isn't it? I mean, God... And all, God makes all, has made all of us as human beings with, with certain powers of choice. We don't choose the day of our birth or death. We don't choose how tall we are or the, the color of our eyes or our skin. But God gives human beings some powers of choice in the span of their lives. And the, the most important choice was kind of this. You're able to obey God, and you're able to disobey God. So man originally was able to sin. That's a state of innocence. The second state, which was um, spoken of at that time, was when Adam and Eve did trespass and go beyond God's boundaries for their lives, their state became not innocent but fallen. They came into a fallen state. And actually, that was much more serious than they first realized. A bit like David. Doesn't seem to be a big thing. I'm the king. I, I'm in control of this realm. He made a choice. And the consequences of that choice were far more serious than he had realized at the time. And that, that's how sin is. Little choices, big effects. But what was, what was the consequence of the choice that was made by our first father, Adam? The whole of humanity, as a result, is fallen. Let's put it this way. Unable, takes a bit of getting into this, unable not to sin. 
That's the second state. Unable, unable not to sin. Well, you might say that, that's, that's a bit harsh. There are people, Jesus met one of them, there are people who are able to keep the Ten Commandments their whole lives. It, it, it is possible and there was a rich young ruler who, who did, and he kept the Ten Commandments. And yet, humanity, all humanity, since Adam, is born unable not to sin. Why? Because you might live a good life, and how many of us have? How many of us have really kept the Ten Commandments? How many of us really? But even if you did you still fallen short of the glory of God. Because without knowing Jesus, his presence does not exist in the human heart. So that second stage, unable not to sin. I must get through these four stages. And then. So what's the third state? Able to sin is the first Unable not to sin is the second. The third is a state of grace which every person who has come to Jesus is in anywhere in the world, which is this. You are able not to sin. You don't have to. Because the Spirit of God exists in the heart of the believer, you now have a power of choice. You do not have to sin as a Christian. It's not that you're without sin, but you don't have to commit sin. And the last one, just to finish these four states off, a state yet to come, and I love this bit, there will come a day for, the, for every person who is part of the new creation where you will be unable to sin. That day is coming when he returns. Unable to sin. Amen. So I find that useful. Four states of man. Able to sin. Unable not to sin. Able not to sin. Takes a bit of remembering, doesn't it? And that's the state of grace for the believer. And the last one yet to come, I will be unable to sin. Amen. When he comes again. So let's just, um, let's just read one more passage from the scripture because nobody can put it as well as the scriptures. And um, let, let's read... A few verses from John's first letter. Um, and we're going to read 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 to chapter 2, verse 1. If we walk in the light as he is in the light... We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Are we going to keep going? We're not going to keep going. Okay, that's probably my fault in the way I uh, uh, notified you of the verses. I'm going to carry on reading then. So I'm going to read from verse 8 on. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. And his truth is not in us. Thank you, Chuba. So um, let's go on to chapter 2, verse 1. And we'll read, read this together. My little children, 
these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. We don't have to do it. It's not that we're free from sin, indwelling sin. That day won't come until I meet him. This mortal body is not yet redeemed. I mean, I, well, you and I pray that God, in his grace, sometimes works in healing power, but this, is, this body is not redeemed. And while I'm, you and I are in our bodies, we are not without sin. We are not sinless. Nevertheless, John says, I've written to you so that you don't. Don't, don't. And if you do, because sin can so easily beset us, if you do, well, you have an advocate with the Father. Amen. Forgive us our trespasses, Lord, but let's not fill our hearts and minds with thoughts about sin. Let's fill our hearts and minds with praise to his name. We were made to glorify him. Amen. Amen.